Hey guys, welcome back to Homesteading Off The Grid. I have a very uh, interesting tale for you today about deja vu, something we've all experienced at times. And I really struggled with how to set the camera angle up for today's story because we've got this beautiful Eastern redbud tree behind me, the beautiful forest coming back into full life here now that spring's upon us, but we have a couple of deer up here too. I wanted you to see them. I don't know if you can though. They're just in right at the tree line in this area. They're about a hundred yards away at the top of this portion of the meadow. They're just watching me talk to myself, <clears throat> looking at me like I'm crazy for doing so. Speaking of which, yes, I know my shirt's on inside out before you go there. It's because there's a trademark logo on the front I don't want to advertise. It's not that I'm against the company or, or the ideology or whatever. Uh, it's just, I'm not, I don't want to put them on my channel. Um, well then why do you even have that shirt then crazy lake? You might ask after me telling you that, well, because it was given to me for free. Uh, well, is that why you wear your orange toboggan or your hat on inside out most of the time? Crazy lake? No, has nothing to do with it. Well, then why do you wear that hat? inside out than crazy lake i hear some of you asking come on isn't it obvious so a couple days ago while i was actually digging up little seedling versions of these uh, eastern redbud trees in this area back here to relocate in a couple different positions around our property and you can see why uh, early spring for about two or three weeks they have these beautiful periwinkle colored blooms on them and uh, it'll take a few more years but at some point we are going to have that surrounding our entire property i view our land as a canvas and there's a method to the madness behind what i put where as far as which types of trees which types of bushes where are certain you know where's where are the fruit orchards it's so that something is constantly blooming throughout the year and the colors blend. It's just that it gets prettier and prettier each and every year. So anyway, um, when I was up there digging those, those little seedlings up there, I told a story about uh, a, a buddy of mine that told me a story about from when he was a kid and he was a baby boomer. Back when he was a kid, there was a gentleman from the World War II generation that used to go around digging holes. Everybody thought maybe he was just digging up trees like me to relocate them. Turns out they found all these bodies later, yada, da 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 da. He wasn't the killer though. It was from previous generations before him. And a couple people commented that um, you've heard a different version of that tale or that I've told a different version of that tale. Uh, somebody even commented that it sounded like a, a lot like the story uh, from my short story collection, October Nights. Um, available in print and Kindle, by the way, from Amazon. The link is in the description box below. Uh, there was a story in that collection, October Nights, called Moving to the Country. Very similar premise. That was not uh, a retelling of that story or the ones you heard. Those types of things happen so frequently that it, it seems as if it's the same story being told over and over, uh, but indeed it's not. And I'll, I use this as an example. When I took guitar lessons many years ago, 20 years ago now, I guess, uh, my guitar instructor, who had been playing his whole life, and he was in his 50s at the time, he wrote some of his own music. He told me, if you ever have an idea for a song, a rhythm, lyrics, go ahead and write it. And he said, if you feel like that song you're writing reminds you of a song you've already heard it's probably because number two reasons number one you may have been influenced by a song you heard or number two everything's already been written every story's already been told everything is just a different version of something that's already been out there and this is when it becomes this is when it comes to uh literature music a lot of art different forms of art especially in regard to the written word he said just do it anyway write your song tell your story so with that said there could be a third explanation 
And it could be that you were having deja vu as you heard the tale. Could it be that you've been here before? Or at least you feel very strongly as if you have. That same friend who told me that tale told me another that same day. And I'm going to share it with you today because it is one of the most odd tales of deja vu I've ever heard. Now, we've talked before about people who can see things that others cannot see, people who can hear things that others cannot hear. Are there people out there that have visions? Are there people who can see through the veil? Are there people that have a third eye? My friend, when he told me this story, told me that he has never considered himself to be any of that stuff. Nobody, he's no one who possesses the ability to do any of those things. And that's why he's remembered this event so acutely because it's the only time anything like this has ever happened now he would not tell me the specific location where this event took place because and when i tried to hold his feet to the fire for the location and the approximate date he said when he was a much younger man and this gentleman is in his early 70s now this happened when he was a much younger man he refused to tell me the location and the date because as he put it all the cool kids these days like to fact check everything and he fears that if somebody were to fact check this story they could put him at the location of the murder at the time the murder occurred at least close enough to where many many years after the murder took place he might be questioned and he wouldn't want that So, what murder am I talking about? Well, the one that took place on that dreadful day in which he felt he was having deja vu, but he thinks it was something quite different than that. Perhaps a vision, perhaps a message from the other side not to go a certain way when he was lost while traveling. This happened many years ago. Uh, I would say the guy was probably in college because he mentioned the concept of spring break. Okay, he talked about how a lot of the cool kids will head south to the beaches for spring break. They'll go down to Florida. They'll go to Myrtle Beach. Uh, unfortunately, even during you know times when they shouldn't because of worldwide pandemics. However, a lot of the cool kids that live out west, like in the Rockies, they'll spend spring break going skiing at many of the various resorts out there. Many come and go. Some of them have been out there for a long time. And it was on one such trip when my friend was a much younger man, when these events occurred. Now this is back way before the time of smartphones and uh, the Google directions, Google Maps, and what predated this stuff. Uh, before Siri and Alexa, there was, uh, I can't remember, about 10 years ago, that that one gadget everybody had for their cars to give them directions. It was basically um, run by satellite. But once upon a time, people used maps and people used atlases, road atlases. And you can tell I'm, I mean, I'm not old. I'm kind of <clears throat> resistant to change when it comes to new technologies. I actually have a road atlas underneath the seat of my truck. But that's great. Because you never know when the battery on the phone might die, the battery in the truck might go out so the charger inside the truck doesn't work. You can never go wrong <clears throat> by keeping a set of maps or an atlas with you if you're traveling. So my friend was somewhere out west. He gave me that much. He was traveling. He was meeting up with some friends at a particular ski lodge. And it was becoming night and he had been lost most of the afternoon. He was looking for a certain intersection, a certain state road, and he said it was frustrating because some of the signposts were marked with the state road route, while others were marked with either the road name or uh, arrows pointing in the direction to a town saying how many miles away it was, but there seemed to be no consistency. So he was looking for a specific state route 
He blew through a four-way intersection. After stopping, he read the signs. The signs uh, gave the name of communities. He went through the intersection and felt so confused, he pulled over at the side of the road and he parked. He went back with his atlas to where the signs crossed and he held his atlas up to the signpost and he was looking and there was a name of a town. It said it was only two miles away in a certain direction. There was another town a couple miles away in the opposite direction, but there were no state routes. And so he was peering onto his map, onto his atlas, looking for the name of the town to see if he could match up the town with the state route so he could at least figure out if he was remotely close to where he, he hoped he was or where he was supposed to be. And suddenly, it was this, as if a migraine headache, something he'd never had before, never had since, came over him, and he felt himself almost collapsing onto this pole. So the next thing he knows, he's in his car. He's turning right to go toward this particular town that's two miles away, according to the, to the road post sign. And he goes about a mile up the road, and there's a guy standing in the road and there, there's snow everywhere the snow's kind of deep this guy's wearing a solid red scarf and one of those hunting caps that has the ear muff things that hang down over the ears camp camouflage the guys flagging him down flagging him down so my friend slows down comes to a stop rolls his window down and he asks the guy if he needs help and the guy says no i just wanted to let you know you're entering a very sharp turn and there is a traffic accident in the turn. So proceed with caution. So my friend thanks the guy for the warning because he had no intentions of slowing down uh, more than he would have needed to, to get through this turn. And so he starts proceeding into the turn very slowly, realizing had he gone through there at the speed he had been traveling, he would have added to the, to the car in distress. He gets into the middle of the turn sees a, a single car in the middle of the road the hood is up and there's somebody wearing all black that's all he, he's no description other than all black bent over looking into the hood of the car so my friend stops the car gets out he starts walking towards this gentleman who's bent over the hood looking at the engine and he hears footsteps behind him running he turns around just in time to see the guy that had flagged him down with the red scarf the camouflage hat with the ear mufflers coming over running at him with a hammer of all things and he swings it and that's the last thing he remembers until he comes to and he's at that road post that signpost leaning up against it and his migraine is suddenly gone he looks up sees the names of the town again can't explain what just happened it was so real, he thought it had happened. He thought he was in his car, thought all these events took place. He decides he needs to spend the night somewhere. He'll figure out where he's going the next day because he wasn't supposed to meet up with his friends until the next day anyway. It was a two-way trip. He was on time. He was just off course or didn't know exactly where he was. So he gets in his car. He decides he's not going to go in the direction of the town that's two miles away where he just had the vision. He's going in the opposite direction towards the other town. So a few miles away in that direction, he comes to a small community. He comes to a small roadside inn. He spends a night. He goes up to his room, he gets his stuff settled into his room, comes back down, they had a small eating area with the fireplace in it. It wasn't, he, he explained to me, it was not a bed and breakfast, but it wasn't a motel either. It was kind of like a small hotel, a lodge, okay? We'll call it a lodge, that's what he called it. So he's down there having dinner, he's sitting in front of the fire, he's tired, he looks over at the bar, there was a bar in this lodge, and he sees the back of two men. One is all in black, okay, black clothing. The other guy is wearing a red scarf, and he has this camouflage hat with the ear muffs that come down tucked into his back pocket. And he recognizes them, potentially, I love that word, as the two men from the vision he had had earlier while he was at the signpost but he never saw their faces. But he kept his eye on them while he ate. They hung out at the bar and they were drinking 
beer, whatever. The whole time he was there, he finished his meal. He went to his room. He slept for the night. The next day, he collects his belongings, gets them together, goes to check out. As he's making his way to the desk to check out, he notices that there's a, another gentleman that he sees clearly, a, an older gentleman, asking for directions to a certain location, which turns out to be that small town that was two miles the other way from the signpost where he had had this vision, this deja vu, most people would call it, though I think you'll understand once we get to the end of the story, it was something considerably different than deja vu. So he hears the guy that runs the inn telling the other gentleman, the older gentleman, how to, to go to where he's headed, and he tells him he has to go through this place. And my friend said he felt as if he should warn the other man about going in that direction. He felt as if he should tell him, if somebody tries to flag you down, don't stop. Keep going. I know it sounds crazy, but if you see a guy that looks like his car is disabled and he's leaning over the, the hood looking at the engine, keep going. Don't stop. Whatever you do, don't stop. But he thought, that's just crazy. And that's exactly what this guy will think I am. He'll think I'm somebody that wears his shirts inside out if he doesn't want to give you know, public acknowledgement to a certain trademark or he wears his orange cap inside out so you can see the tag because... Come on, you guys know exactly why I do that. So he chose instead to say nothing. So that gentleman leaves. My friend goes up, pulls out his atlas, tells the, the guy keeping the lodge where he's going and asks if he can help him get there. Sends him on his way, sends him on his way. No problems. My friend, by the end of that day, met up with his friends who were spring breaking at a ski lodge, not down at the beach. Uh, but while they were there, and while they were watching local news, they saw come across the screen of the television, uh, the reporting of a terrible murder that took place a few hours back the direction from which he'd traveled in a small community that was two miles away from the signpost where he had leaned upon and had his severe migraine headache and his, what he called a vision. Uh, the older gentleman who was the victim of this crime, who had been murdered, they showed his picture And of course, it was the man that he had seen in that lodge asking directions. The man he felt he should warn, but the man that he didn't. My friend told me that he's never had anything like that happen to him before. He never had anything happen like that since. And again, he's in his 70s now. This was probably close to half a century ago. And I asked him because I was curious. I said, you know, you had that experience with the uh, World War II veteran who was digging up all the holes and they found the bodies. And we had a very interesting comment about that as well. Uh, somebody commented that they'd recently bought land upon which they were going to build a house. And when they were exca excavating, you know, I have a hard time with words that have X's and C's together. While they were excavating for the foundation to build the home, they discovered an old cemetery, and it was so old, they found one tombstone where they could see part of the date. It was 1800-something, because the last number was just too worn away. So, the fact is this, you know, we think we know everything that's out there to know. We think we know the history of our properties, where we live. We think we can say, well, my house was built in 1958. We're only the third family to live here. Nothing... Uh, strange or out of the ordinary has happened here. I would know about it otherwise. Well, the person who just bought the land to build the house that found a gravestone from more than 200 years ago would be able to tell you that you might not know quite as much as you think you do. Things have been going on for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, millions of years before we were ever here. And I think we have the answers to all of it. It's poppycock.
See you for more next time from here to Homesteading Off the Grid, where occasionally we do do homesteading, but where we always Well, not always, but a lot of times have some pretty creepy stories to tell.